Well, this evening we're going to be looking at the next section in John's Gospel, chapter 13, which, I, if I'm not mistaken, will complete the first uh, of these five chapters that have to do with um, uh, Jesus' instruction to his disciples in the upper room at the Passover meal. Uh, now, see, this morning we were looking at verses 18 through 30. So what I'd like to do now is pick up in verse 31 and read through verse 38. Again, um, the last thing we saw happen was that um, Judas went out after Jesus took the morsel and handed it to him, uh, and it was night. And then we read in verse 31, Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now again, this morning we saw uh, Jesus' prediction that one of his own disciples was going to betray him. But we also saw that prediction had a purpose. It wasn't to reveal the traitor because really Jesus only told John who it was going to be. But rather it was to convince the disciples who Jesus really is. Uh, that he is God in our nature. Remember that um, Jesus basically was telling them this morning that when this comes to pass you will know that I am. Okay. And we also saw why it was important that we believe that Jesus is more than just a man, why he is God in our nature. Uh, it was important uh, not only for their salvation, because Jesus did tell them on more than one occasion. In John 8, 24, for instance, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And you'll recall what Jesus meant by that is that he is the God of Israel. He is Yahweh. But he also, it's important for them also to assure them that what he had promised them was actually true. That they would see heaven. Because as God, Jesus can assure that they will arrive in heaven through faith in his name. As well as an assurance that what he had promised with regard to his presence with them as they went out to offer uh, basically this relationship with Jesus Christ to others. He would be with him or with them and that the others, of course, who received them would also be receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. So that was the reason why Jesus revealed the fact that there was a traitor without revealing who that traitor is. This evening, we're going to see there was also a purpose behind the betrayal itself. It was that Jesus would be crucified, but that he would be crucified for three reasons, and this is what we want to look at this evening. First, that he might glorify his Father. Secondly, that his Father in turn might glorify him. And then thirdly, that he might bring us to glory, which is going to be the main applicational point, as you probably already guessed. Now, this is what we see in this passage. First of all, we see that Jesus was betrayed that he might glorify his Father. Uh, again, John writes in verses 31 and 32, Therefore, when he, Judas, had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. 
But the first point, of course, is here. God is glorified in the Lord Jesus Christ. Judas' betrayal uh, was set in motion. I should say Jesus' betrayal by Judas was now set in motion now that G Judas was gone. Judas was headed to the chief priests to see how much they, they would be willing to pay him if he would tell them where they could find Jesus away from the crowds so that they might take him and kill him. Remember, they didn't want to do that publicly. They were afraid of a riot, but here Judas would be able to give them an opportunity they had been seeking for for actually quite a number of years now, at least during the three years of his ministry. Now, as we were reminded this morning, this betrayal was a part of the Father's plan all along. That Jesus would be handed over to his enemies that they might put him to death. But again, why did Jesus have to die? Well, for the three reasons that I've already mentioned. And the first was that he might bring honor to his Father, that he might glorify his Father. But the question we really need to ask ourselves is this, how would Jesus' excruciating death on the cross, his shameful death on the cross, bring glory to God? Well, first of all, we need to back up and remember that everything God does, everything he does, he does for his glory. Everything he ever has done, everything he's doing now, everything he will do in the future, he has done for his glory. And what that means is to show us what he is like. God has done everything that he has to reveal himself to us, to show us how great and how powerful he is, to show us how wise and understanding he is, to show us how merciful and gracious he is, and of course to show us how just and righteous he is. That is his purpose behind everything that he has done. Paul writes in Romans 11, verse 36, as he completes basically that section on the explanation of the gospel and how God brought it all about, how he used man's sin in order to glorify his name, and he closes basically with, with this statement, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Again, God did all that he did in order that he may display his glory. To show us again just what he is like. He created all that he has created for his glory. He ordained the fall for his glory. He sent Jesus into the world to do what was necessary to redeem mankind for his glory. Creation basically gave God the stage on which he would reveal himself and an audience who would actually be there to see it. The fall brought about the condemnation of all men so that God might reveal his grace and his justice. And by the way, let's remember that the fall is not God's fault. The fall is man's fault. The fall is our fault because Adam represented us in the garden. God used that sin to bring about all the good things that he has brought about to reveal his glory. He did not cause that sin. Otherwise, God would be guilty for this sin and not us. But he brought about this condemnation. He planned this so that he might reveal the glory of his grace and the glory of his justice. And of course, the work that Jesus did at the cross allowed him to display both of those things, his grace and his justice. And this is where the Father is glorified. This is how he is glorified in the cross. The Father really could not forgive anyone. He could not show his mercy and his grace to anyone unless his justice had first been satisfied. If God was going to forgive us, someone had to pay for our crimes. And that's exactly what Jesus did on the cross for all who would trust him. In Jesus' suffering, in Jesus' death on the cross, God's justice was fully satisfied. At the cross, his justice was displayed. Everybody could see through what the Father did to his Son that God is a God who takes sin seriously. That every crime that has been committed will be justly punished. Do you realize that gives glory to God when his justice is revealed? God is a just God. Now, the part that we're really interested in is this. At the cross, his grace was also on display for all to see. 
We know that Jesus didn't deserve to suffer. He didn't deserve to die. Jesus had not committed any sins. He was spotless and he was blameless. God's grace was displayed in that he sent his son and his son came willingly into the world to take the place of everyone who would look to him in faith to save them from God's justice. God's grace is displayed in that Jesus would come and suffer and die in their place, in the place of those who would trust him. God's grace was glorified in that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that all who would trust in him would not perish but have eternal life. So this is the first reason that Judas betrayed Jesus, that the Father might magnify his justice and his grace on the cross through the death of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But secondly, Jesus was betrayed so that his Father might in turn glorify him. And again, that's contained in those last two verses that we read. So we'll read them again in verses 31 and 32. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. Now, what does that mean? Now, we, we know that Jesus in his divine nature as God was already infinitely glorious even as his father since he is God basically there's nothing that could be added to the glory and honor that was already his but the same was not true with regard to his human nature I want you to notice that Jesus says here now is the son of man glorified and he refers to to his human nature in that statement the son of man because in that nature, Jesus could receive glory. And of course, if you love Jesus, that's what you want to see. You want to see Jesus receive the glory that is his due for doing what he has done. But that's exactly what the Father gave him for revealing his glory, the glory of his grace and his justice. Now, how did he glorify his, his son? You know, we often think of the cross as a time when the Father was revealing just his wrath against his son and certainly he did Jesus our sins were credited to him Jesus suffered and died in our place and he bore the full wrath of God in our place what was meant for us upon himself that was displayed on the cross but we should also note that it was here that the father also glorified Jesus in one way uh, by supporting Jesus through this suffering and death the only reason the human nature of Jesus Christ could actually hold up on the cross and not be destroyed or vaporized or you know, extinguished out of existence by God's wrath against our sins was that God was holding him up, bearing him up. That's one way that the Father glorified the Son, by giving him the grace to endure that wrath and that suffering. He further glorified his son by allowing Jesus to conquer his enemy on the cross and of course our enemy as well because it was at the cross that Jesus delivered that crushing blow to the head of the serpent, the devil and took back what rightfully belonged to him, that is to Jesus. Remember how Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 that he was going to uh, basically bind the strong man and that's what he did on the cross so that Satan would not be able to stop him from spoiling his house or taking back what rightfully belonged to Jesus. So this is another way the Father glorified him. The Father glorified his Son by allowing him to purchase a people that would be his possession for the rest of time. And that includes, of course, you and me, if we're trusting him this evening. The Father would yet glorify the Lord Jesus when he raised him from the dead. Remember, that resurrection was the Father's declaration that he had received the sacrifice that his Son had made for our sins, for the sins that he was bearing, which weren't, were not his own sins, for the sins that killed him and put him in the grave. When that payment was received, death could no longer hold the Lord Jesus, and he broke free from its chains. 
So the father glorified his son in raising him from the dead, publicly declaring that his son had discharged all of our sins. Basically, his payment was received as payment in full. The father would further glorify Jesus by taking him up into heaven, by seating him at his right hand, by bestowing on him all power and all authority over heaven and earth to rule over all things for the good of his kingdom and in giving Jesus the right to judge his enemies on the last day. Those that rejected him are going to be rejected by him. Not vindictively, not by way of revenge, but because they would not repent and receive him. But he will also have the privilege on that day of receiving uh, his own children, his complete bride, to be his reward forever. So Jesus glorified his Father by, again, um, revealing his, his justice and his grace at the cross. And in turn, the Father has glorified Jesus in all these different ways. Now finally, Jesus was betrayed that he might bring us to glory. And here's where we get a bit more applicational, although everything we've seen applies to us. Now Jesus was going to die, and afterwards he was going to be raised and ascend into heaven, but what was going to happen to his disciples? Jesus says they would not be able to follow him. Thankfully he falls up with that second statement, because he had said that earlier to the Jews, remember, and when he said it to them, he meant they weren't going to come at all. John writes in verse 33, Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. But at least in their case, that did not mean they would never come. Because we read in verse 36, where Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now but you will follow me or you will follow later. They couldn't follow now. It wasn't yet their time. I mean, if Jesus basically had taken all of his disciples with him to heaven, where would we be? There would be nobody left to share the gospel. They had to stay so that they could finish their work. Even as Jesus completed his work and laid down his life and entered into glory, they had to finish their work. And when their work was finished, they would follow him and they would receive their reward even as the Lord Jesus went to receive his reward. Now Jesus was going ahead of them to prepare a place for them. And he would soon return to bring them there. I want you to understand he, he didn't mean by that that his second coming was close. But what he meant was they would die either being put to death by their enemies or they would die naturally. I, think, I can only think of one that actually died naturally. The rest of them were martyred. But he was going to return in that way to receive them back to himself. To take them to that place that he had prepared for them in heaven. Uh, he will tell them in this next chapter actually, very early on. As a matter of fact, if we read just a few more verses, we'd bump into it. In chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you... I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ went, as we know. Judas betrayed him. He was found in the garden. He was arrested and again put on trial, found guilty, condemned. He was crucified. He rose again from the dead. And he went to prepare a place for them, but not just for them. He also went to prepare a place for us. That's why he was betrayed. That's why he was crucified. In order that he might save us. So that we could go to heaven. And as it was for them, that is the disciples, so it is for us. We can't follow him right now. At least right at this moment. And we won't be able to until the work that he has for us on earth is done. But once it is done, we will join him in heaven where we will also be able to enjoy the reward that he has promised to us remember the Lord Jesus reminded us that we ought to be laboring for that 
that food that endures to eternal life. That we shouldn't be storing up treasures on earth, but storing up treasures in heaven where no one can take them away from us, where they will not be corrupted, because everything that we have in this world is eventually going to be taken away from us. But whatever we do for the Lord is stored up in heaven, and when we are finally there, we get to enjoy it. Now, understanding what James tells us in James 4, verse 14, that we're basically like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You know, the older we get, the more that appears to us to be the case. When we're younger, it doesn't seem like that. It seems like it's going to be a long, long time, but it isn't. Seeing that it's going to be sooner than we think, what we have in this world isn't important. What is important is what we have in that world which is to come. We will follow Jesus. At some point, we will. And then we will receive that reward that he has for us. But now getting back to another applicational question. How do we know that we're actually going to make it to heaven? How do we know we're going to arrive there someday? Well, Jesus just told us that we would follow him later. When he told his disciples, he was not talking just to them, but to everyone who would follow in their footsteps, who would have the same faith that they have. We will follow him later if we are trusting him, if we are obeying him now. But how do we know that we're not going to fall away between now and, and then? Well, I think that's one of the reasons that the Lord gave us this example that he has of Peter. Here he shows us that even if we fall so far away from him that we would deny him, Jesus still is not going to let go of us. Now again, that's provided that isn't our lifestyle of continually denying the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the best Christians fall into sin. Even the best Christians lapse into pretty serious sin. Uh, every believer actually, as we know, sins in many different ways every single day in, in our words, in our thoughts, in our deeds. But even when we fall as far as Peter... He will not let go of us. Now we read in verses 37 and 38. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Now, Peter thought that his love and his commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ was so strong that he would gladly have laid down his life for Jesus Christ right at that moment. Now, we need to be thankful, I'm sure he was, that his salvation did not depend on the strength of his love, but it depended on the strength of Jesus' love for him, as our salvation also does. Because far from laying down his life for the Lord Jesus he denied him very soon, again, just within the next few hours, denied three times that he even knew who he was. Now, there are times when we think that our love is stronger than it actually is, but we end up failing the Lord as well as Peter. At times like this, we need to remember that the love that moved God to send his son into the world to die for us while we were still his enemies will not let go of us now that we have become his friends, now that we have been reconciled by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, in Luke's gospel, we find that Jesus had something else to say to Peter on this occasion that John did not record. In Luke 22, verses 31 through 32, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now, Jesus has already told Peter, Peter, you're going to fail. You're going to deny, deny me three times that you even know me. But by God's grace, Peter, you are going to turn back. I have prayed for you. And I'm going yet to use you when you turn again to build up my church and to strengthen my brethren. You know, the Lord went to the cross in order to save us. And having saved us, the Bible says in 1 John 2, 1, that Jesus is continually interceding for us. And the reason that he does that 
is so that nothing in heaven or earth would ever be able to separate us from his love, which is what we read in our meditation this evening. Our Lord Jesus loved us. He laid his life down for us to redeem us to himself. And having redeemed us, he will never lose us. Remember what he said in the, uh, the parable of the good shepherd? I give them eternal life, his sheep, those who trust him, who believe in him, those whom the Father has given to him. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. If the Lord has given you his life, you will not perish even when you fall into sin because his love for you is that great. And speaking of love, let's just close on this note. Uh, we see here again the command that Jesus has often been repeating uh, of what we are to do for one another while we're waiting on earth, while we're uh, waiting to follow Jesus, while we're doing the work he has called us to do. He says in verses 34 through 35, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now Jesus, of course, is talking about the love that we are to share amongst one another as believers, but I'll tell you what, I believe Jesus wants us also to love those who are outside the church with the same kind of love that Jesus loves uh, not only his disciples, but everyone he came in contact with. He is the example. Now Jesus was about to be betrayed that he might lay down his life and bring us to glory. And he says, follow my example. Lay down your lives for one another in love. He said this would be our greatest testimony, the greatest testimony that we could provide to the reality and the power of Jesus' love for us and for all mankind. Again, I think it's interesting the Lord repeats this over and over again. He wants us to love one another. He wants us to follow his example. He wants us to serve one another. He wants us to lay down our lives for one another. He wants it to be obvious to all men so that they would know that he lives. So may the Lord then, if that is what he desires, the one whom our, well, that we love most of all, if that's what he wants, then may the Lord grant that we might be filled with his spirit, filled with his love, that we might be able to do this. Again, Jesus has shown his love toward us in laying down his life and giving his all for us as we were reminded this morning in the Lord's Supper. Let's renew our commitment to serve him, honor him, and love him. And in doing so, to love others in the name of Jesus that they might come to know him. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer. and Let's ask the Lord to apply these words to our hearts.